In estimation, we're trying to infer some meaningful parameter or quantity from the data that we measure. For example, we might want to measure the distance to an aircraft from a radar return. So we talk about parameter estimation. And the model that we're using here is that the data x, and in general we're assuming there's multiple samples of data, depend on some unknown parameter alpha. And so there's a probability distribution that describes that dependence, and we can write that x, we can write that x depends on a probability distribution f of x and the parameter alpha. And our goal then is to observe data x and try to estimate alpha. As an example, we can look at estimating the velocity of a vehicle using a radar gun. So what we're going to do is transmit an electromagnetic pulse from the radar gun, and it has frequency f naught. And when that reflects off the vehicle because of the motion of the vehicle and the Doppler principle, we know that the signal coming back is going to have a different frequency. We'll call that f sub d. And our goal is to estimate the velocity v. Well, if we can identify f sub d, from the received data, what is the frequency of the pulse that comes back, then we should be able to infer the velocity. So we're going to start by assuming that the pulse we transmit has a known frequency. So then from the shift in frequency, fd minus f naught, I can find the velocity. And a simple model is to assume that our data takes the form of a cosine with frequency fd and then some amplitude and phase and in the presence of noise, as we're measuring a noisy signal in general. And our goal, from an estimation standpoint, is to estimate FD. So we're going to do that by forming some function of the data. We'll assume here that there's capital N samples of data from x of 0 through x of n minus 1. We want to apply some function to those to compute what we think the, the frequency estimate FD hat would be. So that's a parameter estimation problem. FD is a parameter that's embedded in our data, and we want to estimate that using some function of the data. So let's call, in general, alpha hat be the estimate of alpha. And we'll use hats to put over quantities to denote that they're estimated quantities. And we could right away ask a couple questions. Well, how do we find what G should be? And maybe before we even start looking at that, we might want to understand how to characterize the quality or goodness of a particular estimator G. Because then you might say, well, if we know what makes an estimator uh, high quality, we'll then try to find estimators that are of the highest quality. So we're going to look in this little lecture at the second question here in measuring the quality of an estimator G. Now x, our data, is random, we're assuming a probabilistic model, and since g is a function of random data, then our estimate alpha hat is random. So in other words, our estimate alpha hat is described by a probability density function. So when we ask about the quality of our estimate, we really want to know how concentrated the probability density function for alpha hat is around the true alpha. In other words, how close are we going to be to the true value? So we can quantify this in a with a couple simple measures that we'll look at. And to do that, we're going to assume that in general, we want to measure, estimate multiple parameters. So alpha will be a vector of multiple parameters. And therefore, alpha hat is also a vector containing those parameters. So first of all, we're going to define bias as the difference between, between the true value and the mean value that we get alpha hat. So we're taking the expected value of alpha hat minus the true value, and that will give us a measure of the bias. We say that if the mean value of our parameter estimate is equal to the true value, 
in other words, the bias is zero, then alpha hat is an unbiased estimator. In general, you might say, well, that's a good thing. We would want the mean of our estimated parameter to be equal to the true value. Well, then we can also ask how much variation there is about the mean. In other words, how much spread is there? And we can do that using variance if it's a scalar quantity, or if we're estimating a vector, we can talk about covariance and also look at how the errors in the different parameters are related to one another. So we'll define a covariance matrix C, which is a function of our estimator alpha hat, and that's just going to be the expected value of the estimate minus the mean times the estimate minus its mean transpose. So here we have a column vector times a row vector, because alpha hat is a column vector, and this alpha hat transpose is a row vector. So the, the product of these two things gives me a square matrix, and then I'm taking the average value or the expectation of that. And then on the diagonals of this square matrix C is where the variance of the individual components of the estimator are located. So those are going to be down the, down the diagonals because the diagonal elements are the entries of these vectors squared. So an ideal estimator is going to have a small variance. We want it to be fairly tightly concentrated about its mean value, and hopefully that mean value is the true value, or the estimator would also be unbiased. And we can talk more generally about something called mean squared error, and I'm going to look at the mean squared error for an individual element in alpha hat, in other words, one of the parameters that we're estimating. So if we look at the ith element, that's going to be the difference squared between the estimated value and the true value of the parameter. And it turns out it's fairly straightforward to show that the mean squared error is the variance of that parameter plus the square of the bias for that parameter. So if the estimate is unbiased, then this term would be zero, and the mean squared error is identical to the variance. So mean squared error takes into account both variance and bias. Now in general, we can write a mean squared error matrix for this vector parameter alpha hat as a sum of the covariance matrix and the outer product of the bias. So again, this is a column vector times a row vector, which is going to give me a square matrix of the same size as C. So that's just a more general way of writing it. Well, let's look at an example. And we're going to assume that we have three samples of data, x1, x2, and x3 and that those are from a Gaussian distribution with mean m and variance sigma squared. And what I'd like to do is use these three samples to estimate the mean and sigma squared. Okay, so in this notation, x1 is normal mean sigma squared, x2 is normal mean sigma squared, and x3 is normal mean sigma squared. So each of these have the same distribution. I just get three observations. So if I want to estimate the mean, the obvious thing to do is take the average of the three data points and we call this a sample mean estimator. And if I do this for a case where I've got data that has a mean of one and a variance of one, and I repeated this experiment 2,000 times, what I've shown down here in this graph is a histogram where of those 2,000 times, how many cases ended up with uh, estimated mean in the particular interval shown by the width of these blue bars. What you can see is that our estimated value roughly runs from minus 1 up to 3, although very few of those 2,000 cases ended up either real large and negative or um, near 3. Most of the cases ended up centered around 1, and this looks like it's probably unbiased because half the time the cases appear to be greater than 1, half the time less than 1, 
and if indeed you average the 2,000 estimates to get an idea of the mean value of our estimator, it comes out very close to 1. It's 1.02. Well, let's estimate the variance. Now, if you've taken classes in statistics, you know that there's two different variance estimators. And the first one I'm going to look at would be the so-called biased estimator of variance, where we take the sample of data minus its estimated mean and square that, and we average that over our three samples. So we're dividing by 3 times sum i equals 1 to 3x i minus m hat squared. And it's known that this is a biased estimator. And we can see that if we repeat this experiment 2,000 times and look at our estimates. Here again we've got a histogram and you see the true value should be at 1, but our distribution is concentrated um, primarily less than 1. I mean there's some values out here that occasionally you get a value of 3 or 4, but that happens fairly infrequently. Most of the time we're going to get values that are less than 1. And if you look at, on average, what over these 2,000 experiments, what do you get for our estimate of variance using this formula? It comes out to be 0.67, which is fairly significantly below 1. And that's a consequence of this estimator being biased. So if we look at the unbiased estimator of variance, in that case, for the unbiased estimator, if you're averaging over n samples, you divide by n minus 1. So in this case, we're averaging over three values, so we're going to divide by 2 instead of just dividing over the number of samples that we average. And this estimator, indeed, turns out to be unbiased. Here's our histogram. We again see a similar shape to the previous one, although the mass is approximately equal on each side of 1 and consequently if I average all the estimates in these 2000 cases here we get 1.01 .01, which is very close to the true value. So this is indeed going to be an unbiased estimator. 